and welcome to our breakout session, How USAA Moves Quickly and Manages Vulnerabilities with DBT Cloud. My name is Kit Alderson. I am a data engineer at the United Services Automobile Association, or USAA for short. And I'm Ted Douglas. I'm also a data engineer at USAA, and Kit and I work together on the same team. So we're responsible for managing the DBT CICD pipeline and making sure that we're ready to take advantage of new features from DBT Labs. Um, th this is a lot of text, but to boil it down, the mission of USAA is to empower our members to achieve financial security through comp highly competitive products, exceptional service, and trusted advice. So we seek to be the number one choice for the military community and their families. And so before we get started, I'd like to thank DBT Labs for giving us the opportunity to speak and thank all of you for attending our session. So today we're going to be relating some of our recent experience with DBT and some things that we've noticed. Um, so as we've adopted DBT and matured our use of it, we have noticed two things. One is that DBT Cloud has enabled us to go a lot faster, so to the point where we can now have new real-time delivery of data. And the second thing is the need for safe Python models. So sure, you can use Python models in DBT now, but if you pull in third-party packages, do you have visibility into if those packages have vulnerabilities or not? So that'll be part two. Ted's going to talk to us about speed first. All right. So yeah, talking about speed, so I'm going to start with a brief introduction and uh, the history of USAA and our uh, modernization journey. So to start modern, modernization, we need, to know, we need to know why we wanted to modernize. So these are the reasons why we wanted to modernize our system. So we had outdated practices. Uh, meaning ETL, which was uh, on-premises on applications and databases that uh, performed well for the time, but gradually got worse and worse and slower and slower as load and demand grew. Uh, at, at USA, ETL meant that we would extract the data from the source tables on a nightly batch into flat files, and then we would transform those data the, the data sets and then the application, having to read in uh, the flat files, <coughs> excuse me, um, which was a lot of heavy I.O., which was slow before we could even start processing and transforming the data. Then we would load the data into target tables and other intermediate flat files for further processing. All of this resulted in you know, jobs that took hours at a time. Beyond the outdated practices, we also um, were hindered by the, the, the tool-specific skills needed uh, to develop, which um, meant steep learning curves for new developers that take months to get up to speed. And these tools also required um, complicated mechanisms for promoting code to upper environments, which often included manual uh, intervention from the developers or the support teams. And then as we brought in more and more data, uh, performance degraded more and more. And then also, um, we rec recognized that we needed modern tooling so we could attract um, and identify talent with industry standards um, skill sets. As an added incentive at USAA, our um, database of choice was reaching its end of life and was no longer going to be supported. So that's why we modernized. And then uh, how we modernized was first, uh, we went from you know, ETL to ELT, where we would extract and load the source table or the source data into a shared table, shared database, and using uh, push down SQL to transform the data, um, which immediately cut you know, some problematic jobs that ran for hours down to minutes, which was great. And then we uh, transitioned to the cloud database which performed obviously much better and um, was scalable and therefore reduced uh, job times as well. And then finally, as we moved to DBT Cloud, we uh, also got some gains in the, the job times thanks to the orchestration that the DBT provides instead of having to manually you know, schedule and things to, and that overhead. Uh, but even a bigger gain was the, the fact that DBT Cloud was able to um, get incorporated into our pipelines so that we could promote and move code 
um, uh, in a better fashion without all the manual processes and intervention. So like I said, so in the pipeline, in this example, you can see the um, USAA, we have uh, single tenant dev and prod instances. And then um, by leveraging the DBT uh, cloud administrative APIs, we're able to kick off, compile, and build jobs where people push code uh, into our repo. And then when it's time to merge that code uh, into the, the main branch, we run tests and are able to pull artifacts down from DBT to push into our um, test case repository, um, which allows for uh, audibility um, purpose. And then when it's time to promote the prod, we again use the same APIs to make calls to migrate um, job and environment configs from the dev instance to prod. And then we can run a sanity build and gen generate docs for lineage. Um, So this next slide is really just to illustrate um, the pace at which we were able to transition from legacy, from our legacy tools to DBT. So you can see we started in uh, about April 2023 and um, kind of ramped up about March 2024. So us being able to move off of the legacy and into the uh, DBT in under a year is really pretty fast. It might not seem fast to smaller companies, but for one as large and as regulated as uh, we are, that was a pretty big deal. And then you can kind of see that the, the costs are overall are, are kind of the same, because um, the initial migration was just a lift and shift of the push down SQL into the DBT models. Um, and then in the later part of the year, you can see costs are trending downward um, as we were able to you know, focus on improving cost and speed. And then as promised, uh, we do have, this is an oversimplified version or example of uh, the new real-time project that Kid alluded to, where we were able to push code um, from schema changes and things into um, prod really quickly. So the, the premise here is, is that for this project, um, the, the team is using Kafka events that the, the source application um, posts when they insert data into the operational table. This is allows the, the new real-time jobs to run in like five minutes instead of waiting for all the batch processing, which was a great milestone. But as a side effect, if there are changes to the Kafka events, we can look at the Kafka schemas, uh, identify changes, and programmatically build up or update um, the DBT models, push them into the source repo, and then have it in the pipeline and moving to production in a matter of minutes, which was another great milestone for us. So uh, overall, you can see that um, as we moved and uh, modernized, uh, our time to market was way faster. Data delivery and job times went way faster, which all made our executives super happy. Um, a case in point is that new real-time project I just talked about. Um, was just recently uh, given a uh, pace setter award to the company. Also, um, there's been a modern, modernization domino effect. So as we've proven how fast we can go, we've been able to identify other bottlenecks and uh, put other teams on the hook for improving their processes, which we're also excited about. And then finally, um, with the, uh, the DBT cloud and the uh, code first philosophy, we're able to attract and build talent with common industry skill sets, such as Git, SQL, and Python, which was more, which was, I guess, announced last, coalesce, I believe, right? Um, so we're able to use those skills and those tools to uh, keep our pipelines and jobs running faster than ever. And now Kit will talk All about right. vulnerabilities. So how many of you are using Python models in DBT? OK, interesting, interesting. Great. If you're not, that kind of is maybe a good thing because of what I'm about to say. So let's talk about vulnerability management. So if you're going to use Python models in DBT, the odds are you're going to want to use some third-party packages to make transforming your data easier, like pandas or NumPy, kind of the bread and butter of your data science world. And that's great. But when you start to pull in third-party packages, 
into your dbt models, you're going to start seeing vulnerabilities in your dependencies. Or worse, you won't see them. They'll be there, but you'll have no idea that you're actually running vulnerable code in your cloud database. So right now, if you're using Python models in dbt, can you answer these questions? So are you using any, any packages that have licensing issues? And uh, what about critical vulnerabilities? Do any of your third-party packages have like open you up to attack vectors? And then lastly, can you ensure that an SBOM is created to represent your DBT project? Well, what is an SBOM? It's not a new defense technology. It won't blow up. Um, it's also not a fictional band name, uh, if you get the reference, which I didn't, so that's OK. Um, a software bill of materials is a formal record containing the details and supply chain relationships of various components used in building software. It's an ingredients list for your DBT project. So it's going to show you this model uses these third-party packages. These third-party packages have these dependencies with these versions and on and on all the way back. So you can kind of see the whole like flow of software all the way from source to where you are. And so currently, this is not mandatory. I don't think there's any federal regulation that requires you to use these. However, it's a good idea because that way when your manager comes to you and says, you know, oh, the, the next log4j is happening, are we affected? You can say, no, we're good because we scan all our SBOMs and we know that we're fine. Or actually, the scan detected that three of our DPT projects use packages that have this vulnerability. We're going to bump them up to the next version, and that'll be resolved like today. So we're good. So if we can create an SBOM, we can answer those three questions about licenses, vulnerabilities, all these things. So how would we, how would we do this? Well, let's take the example of a Python application just for software, not DBT. Well, it, be pretty easy to create an SBOM in this case because we'll probably have a lock file that has all the dependencies and what versions they're using. So all we have to do is take those dependencies, put them in the SBOM format, and there's packages that will make that easy. So in your pipeline, generate the SBOM, upload it, scan the SBOMs regularly. But with dbt, this gets a little bit more complicated. So dbt doesn't have a lock file that lists all the Python packages you're using. It has a lock file for dbt packages, but if you want to see what, all, what are all the third-party Python packages are being used, that's just, you'll have to go digging through all your model configs. Either, so you, a developer could define that like at the model level, at the file level, at the project level, um, and they can even specify different, third, like, different versions of the same package in different models. So if we were going to write a script to go and parse out all of these dependencies from the project that get really crazy, really technical, be hard to maintain, and difficult to do. So thankfully, DBT Labs actually provides that list of packages in the manifest.json run artifact. So really all we have to do is run something in DBT Cloud for the latest commit so that we generate an updated version of that manifest.json artifact, then download it, and then parse that JSON for those Python packages. Now you might be asking yourself, self, what about the dbt discovery API? And that's true. You can absolutely use the dbt discovery API to get the list of Python packages for your project, but you're just going to have to, uh, you're going to have to write a very specific query, and you're going to have to update that query if dbt adds support for Python to other objects besides models. So if they say, you know, next year that, oh, we're, you can now use Python in tests or macros, you'll have to update this query to pull the packages for those as well. If you just parse manifest.json, you're going to get everything, no matter what object it's associated with. So that's what we decided to do, but do whatever works for you. Um, so in this example here, we're going to use the dbt administrative API. Um, this example uses Snowflake as the cloud database and JFrog Artifactory um, for like artifactory, artifact management. So in this example, we have two jobs. One is a compile job that will just tr uh, use that admin API to trigger a compile for, this, for the latest commit in dbt cloud, and that'll make sure that manifest.json gets created. 
Then we have this published job, and that's going to, again, use the API to pull down that manifest, and then we'll have some code to parse that to pull out the unique list of Python packages. Great. And there's actually even a Python package that will make it easier to parse the JSON that's out there in the community. So if you want to use that, you can. OK, so now we have a list of packages. Should be pretty easy to generate the SBOM out of those. But the problem is we still haven't done our license and vulnerability checks. So this is where we get a little bit more database specific. Um, so Snowflake, when you're running in Snowpark, there's, they provide all the Python packages you can use in their environment. Um, and those might be safe, but they're not super concerned about that. So if you want to perform your own scanning on those, what you should probably do is take their Anaconda Snowflake channel and replicate it into some place like JFrog Artifactory and then do like x-ray scanning on that. So you can then come up with a list of all the vulnerabilities that are associated with all the packages that could run in Snowflake. And then what you should do is create a block list in Snowflake to make sure that those will never run, the ones that are, have critical vulnerabilities. Um, but so that's one layer of safety, but it'd be really nice to be extra careful and also let people know, like stop people before they even get to prod in the first place. Um, so in our process, once we have the unique list of packages used in our project, we then want to pull down all the lists of the vulnerabilities associated with packages in the Anaconda Snowflake channel and compare. And if we find anything that we're, if we find that the developer is trying to pull through a package with a critical vulnerability, stop them right there, fail the pipeline, they never get out of dev, they never deploy their code. Um, or another thing you can do is if you're using GitLab, you can actually create a dependency scanning JSON file and it will show up in the merge request and then you can set up rules to require special overrides and all these things. Um, because maybe that package is on the allow list um, in Snowflake. It's actually okay for some reason. Um, so you can set that up as well. So once you've done your check to make sure that all your Python packages are good to go, you should then create a new Conda environment, Conda install all of the Python packages from your Anaconda Snowflake channel into a Conda environment, and then there's a Python package out there called Cyclone.js bomb that will just create the S bomb for you. Um, and if you want to SBOM in a different format, there's like a few industry standard formats, you can, there's packages that will do that for you as well. Um, so there you go. Now you have an SBOM file. Now you can upload it to the same place where the rest of your organization is uploading all of their SBOMs for all their other software. And they can get, then you can just scan all those regularly. And then you'll have an enterprise wide levels of insight into all the vulnerabilities everywhere. So that way, when there's the next, log4j or the next critical vulnerability, you can know exactly where that's happening and if your DBT projects are affected. So, whoop. All right, now we have the SBOM. Can we ensure that only acceptable licenses are used? Yes. Can we make sure that we're not using critical vulnerabilities? Yes, and obviously we'll have an SBOM created to represent the system, meeting whatever future regulatory requirements ever come into place. And so you can do this too. So you can either, you need to make sure you've generated uh, the state for the latest commit by running something in DBT Cloud. And then you can pull down the manifest.json or hit up the DBT Discovery API, parse out the Python packages, compare them with your vulnerability lists, and then create the SBOM, upload it, scan. There you go. So one final note about the extreme flexibility that DBT gives developers, um, which is a good thing, but for creating SBOMs can make things a little bit tricky. So because you're running in Snowflake, each model will get created in a separate runtime environment. So that means that a developer could say, I want model A to run with Python 3.9, model B to run with Python 3.10, and model C to run with Python 3.11. So if then we have to install all of those packages in all the third-party practices into a Conda environment, well, that Conda environment can only have one Python version. Uh, the developers could also say, I want to use NumPy 1.2 in this model, and then NumPy 1.3 in this model. And again, if we're installing everything into a Conda environment, we can only install one version of a package at a time. So 
If you want to allow this level of flexibility, you're going to have to adapt the process that we've shown here to handle that. Uh, I don't know if that means, that could mean generating multiple SBOMs per project. Um, alternatively, you can just provide some boundaries for your developers and say, look, you probably should only be using one Python version per DPT project anyway. And do you really need to use two different versions of the same package? Or can we treat this like a software application where actually you probably just need NumPy 1.3 instead of having multiple versions of that same package floating around in all these different places? So that's, that's about the extreme flexibility. The other thing is that your SBOMs could get stale if your developers don't pin their packages. So if they just go into their DBT YAML and they say, you know, use NumPy, it's going to pull in the, whatever is the latest version of NumPy in the Anaconda Snowflake channel at runtime and use that. So you'll still create the SBOM, and it will put whatever is the latest version in the SBOM at that time. But then, say you're running in prod, later Snowflake adds a new version of NumPy. Now in production, you're running with a later version than what's in your SBOM. And so now your SBOM is stale, and let's say there's a, tomorrow there's a critical vulnerability with this latest version. You'll never know about it. You'll never get alerted. So for this reason, um, we would recommend that you force everyone to pin their packages in DBT. So, and this is pretty easy to check in your CICD pipeline. You can just make sure that when you get that unique list of packages, they all have equals equals a version number at the end. Um, and that way you can make sure that when you're running code in Snowpark, it's always going to be the same version until your users decide to update it. Uh, so yeah, to summarize, um, we went over how USA modernized and moved away from outdated processes to the DBT-led modernized version that's got our ADLC running faster than ever. Then with SBOMs, you can quickly identify and fix vulnerable Python packages, which has let um, us mitigate risk and keep our data safe at USA. All right, so thank you for coming to our session, and we can now take some questions, and feel free to hit us up on the DBT Slack. Yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand. I've got a microphone in the back of the room, and I'll walk over to you. If, as, you're, uh, as you're asking, uh, please make sure to keep the microphone relatively close to your mouth, because you hold it down here, no one's going to be able to hear what you say. Uh, hey, I came to this because I was chatting with someone that I actually haven't heard a lot about DBT for Python uh, at this conference. Last year, it was a big announcement. Right. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, huh, like, is nobody using it? It's nice to, to hear that someone's using it and that you guys, it sounds like you've solved some of the problems uh, that come up. But I was curious, like, what were the use cases that, that made you want to use DBT for Python uh, initially? Because I also think that some of the lack of adoption might be that they, people ran into these problems, but also some of the lack of adoption might be that like pe people just aren't sure like what are the use cases where DBT for Python would help. So in our area, I will say everyone uses SQL because everyone was an ETL developer at one point, and so they're pretty database savvy, and so they just use SQL for everything. I know over at Enterprise, which is not our line of business, um, there are some Python models, but we were asked to set up the SBOM creation so that if people wanted to, they could use Python. So this was like a prerequisite to us even adopting it in the first place. Otherwise, yeah. USAA would say, you just can't use Python. Yeah, that was a contingency for us to turn on the functionality, both in Snowflake and DBT, was that we had protections in place to identify vulnerabilities and only use um, good packages. Yeah, so I can't actually give you a lot of information about um, specific, use case. specific use cases for Python models at, DB, at USAA because it's actually still pretty early for us. Um, but hopefully, as more data science folks start to get involved, um, they'll want to pull in. I mean, so far, the data science team is not in DBT. Um, but if they do get pulled in, I think they'll, they're not going to want to switch to SQL. Um, they're going to want to keep using like, all the packages they're familiar with, I'm sure. 
Any other questions? Hey, so you might have partially answered this already just now with that comment, but you know, you said you migrated from whatever you had before to DBT, I think you said in about a year, Ted. To what extent of the organization are you talking about, right? Because I assume you're not the only two data engineers, you have 16 million customers, and with that I assume that there's a lot of data to do that. So two questions, what, you know, to what degree did the migration happen? And two, if it was enterprise-wide, like what Jedi mind trick did you use to get everybody on board? Um, so we, like I kind of said, you know, the, um, our database was going away. So we, there was a forced migration off of that. That helps those conversations along. Our specific, like that um, cost slot I showed, that is just specific to our organization, property and casualty within the company. Um, we have bank and uh, life, these guys come up. But, <laughs> Um, so, you know, their journeys might be a little bit different, not faster or slower, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, USA, I think, as an enterprise level, we were on a modernization journey, because um, it, it was, yeah, I've been at the company like 18 years, when it first started, the whole data side was just kind of an afterthought, you know, you'd build a new app or whatever, and then it would get in production, and then find out, you know, a little while later, the executives are like, well, I don't even know if this is working. So, I'm um, having been on that side of the fence. I mean, I know that, you know, you would have your requirements that you go through everything else, but, um, but I think as data has become more and more important in USA as well as everybody else, um, I think it was a pretty easy decision to, to get everybody on board, all the, the, the people with the money. Mm -hmm. um, DBT was gonna be the transformation tool for the cloud and the cloud database. Um, but how you use DBT definitely varies greatly across the organization because it's still pretty siloed. I think that's starting to change. Um, but like, for example, bank went first and they had some really tight deadlines. And so, and they're actually like way more regulated even than we are. So their implementation of DBT looks quite different than ours does at PNC. Um, but I mean, we're all unified in the fact that we're using DBT yeah. So we, we have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? We have time for about maybe one, maybe two more. Okay. I think I saw that there was like a cost slide. What would you attribute to some of those efficiencies as you were migrating from your legacy to your current stack? Um, like I was talking about the, the, the downward trend. That's right, yeah. Um, and also from like the legacy, it looks like an overall step jump downward as well. Well, so the legacy, as we ramped up DBT, we ramped down the legacy, so that's why that sharply declined there at the intersection. Um, we do still have some leftover legacy jobs that haven't um, been able to get their sources into the cloud yet, but I don't know, we're evaluating tools to get that done in the next few months. Um, the decline at the end, um, <coughs> we've had different um, mechanisms we've developed to identify, you know, slow running queries and, and looking at the explain plans and getting people to optimize. We've, you know, done some changes to how we use warehouses and snowflake and different things like that. We've but, had contests and you can win oh, yeah, prizes yeah, yeah. For, for saving yeah, snowflake we, costs? We have incentivized the, the community to find ways to cut costs. Um, it'd be in DBT or Snowflake and all that, so yeah. That's part of the, I think, the tight deadlines, because like your database is going away. You have to move very quickly, and so there was a lot of copying and pasting, Yeah, I think. So that explains why the cost didn't change a whole lot. So yeah, the push down SQL wasn't necessarily efficient or you know optimized, so yeah, we've had to work to get that better. <laughs> All right, if uh, there are no other questions, we will wrap it up. Thank you, Ted and Kit. Um, you'll be hanging around for a little bit afterwards if people want to come Certainly. and ask, uh, ask uh, questions one-on-one, but let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.